Hey, I'm Dave from the Disc Golf Dyers Guild. So we have a very special episode of Dying to Listen podcast with a very special guest, Bobby from The Difference is Doing It. I'm almost guaranteed you've seen one of his videos or you learned something from him. If not, where have you been? Stop this podcast. Please go watch his YouTube and go to his website. I guarantee you'll be happy and you'll learn something. So buckle up and get ready because it's going to be a ride. So, haha. <laughs> <laughs> Bobby, I am very humbled and um, honored that you are on the podcast, and I can't wait for this. So let's just, I guess, dive right on in. I'm stoked to be here, buddy. Thanks for having me. Yes. <clears throat> um, so what got you started into disc golf? Disc golf, I guess, I guess will be dating me right off the bat, but <laughs> it was a little over... 20 years ago and I was just out of college living in Tempe, Arizona with a bunch of buddies and we weren't, you know, we didn't know anything about disc golf. We were all really just into Frisbee and we would go out and huck them all the time together, just trying to do different cool throws and catches and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, we got pretty damn good. But like I said, we didn't know a thing about disc golf. That is, until we stumbled upon a course that was just like a few blocks away from our house. And we're like, what is this? So <clears throat> we grabbed our ultimate Frisbees and the four of us <laughs> ran down to the course and knocked out our first round while everybody with like real disc golf discs were pointing and laughing at us pretty much, <laughs> pretty much the whole time. But like I said, we were good with the ultimate disc. So, you know, it was a pretty good round, but... There was a pro shop right there off the course and we went in after the round and all four of us like built our first bag of four or five discs out of a big box of used discs that they had there, like out of the discs that they picked out of the river. And then the four of us pretty much just jumped right in the deep end from there. You know, the course, like I said, was like almost in walking distance from our house. So we played all the time. <laughs> all the time those those maybe that year or two that we lived out west together and then the rest you know like as they say is history <clears throat> i i spent the next probably two or three years traveling all around the country for work and it didn't matter where it was i it was easy to find a course and some huck buddies to get around him with and then i don't know maybe probably like 15 years ago or so i settled here in maryland and I was lucky enough to find some guys that were into disc golf right off the jump. And, you know, now they pretty much all become my inner circle of best friends. And, you know, we help, we help them together almost every weekend. Disc golf is what brings us together almost every weekend while, you know, the real world is trying to pull us in every other direction. And, you know, when I think about it, like this, through all those 20 plus years, Disc golf's been the glue to a lot of different relationships and, and held them together. And and more than that, like I used to be a real competitive bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Just a bastard. Like, yeah, I cared about winning way too much. And disc golf, like, it helped chill me out some, especially in, this, in, the, in the sporting arena. And, like, now I, I used to care a lot about the score that I put on the card. And now, like, it really is just, a, like, all about who's on it. Um, so that's that's how it started way back when. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, since you've been playing for so long, do you have a favorite course that you like? I'm lucky that here, where I live in Maryland, there's, like, three or four courses all within but basically a half-hour distance. Kinder Farm Park is probably the one I would call my home course. Calvert Road Park that's on the Washington side um, is a favorite as well. We're really close to Rockburn Branch Park, and um, it's just a good spot th that we're close to a lot of them. I, 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 if I were forced to pick a favorite, it's probably Kinder. I have the most history there. We've, we've been playing there since since back in the days when it was just nine holes. It's been taken over by like a super cool group of guys. They're all such dudes who take really good care of the course. And I mean, not just like the condition that it's in, but there's always something going on there. Um, so that that's probably that's probably my favorite Kinder Farm Park. Do you have any of your original discs that you first bought? I do. I have one of them. Uh, it is it's one of my putters. It is the Blunt Gum Putt. 
I don't know if you know that disc. It's a it's a putter that is like rubber and just mm. <laughs> bends right in half. I don't have it out here on the box with me. I'd show it to you, but um, that is that's the only one that has survived since then because you know it's tough to throw a putter into the woods or the water. I guess, but <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's the one that has survived. <clears throat> What got you into disc dying? It's a long story. There's a long, <clears throat> there's a long, I guess, and somewhat hard to listen to, probably more personal version of that story and a shorter, you know, more generic, you've probably heard it all before version. Since we've got a good hour to fill here, at the risk of things maybe getting a little heavier than most people anticipated, I'll, I'll take the scenic route around this time. But I'm, I'm going to warn you, like if I'm going to tell this story, there's a good chance I'm going to moat some along the way. <laughs> along the way, so <clears throat> here we go, I guess. I don't know, I mean, there's all sorts of obvious and awesome reasons to get into disc dying. And like, like my main man, Primetime, would say, when you look good, you play good. <laughs> and we all know that dyed discs fly way further and straighter than undyed discs. So that probably had a little something to do with it. And there's no question that it is an absolute pant load of fun. Uh, but like just pretty plastic and a really good time is definitely not enough to have fostered a full blown addiction in me for this long. My, the, the real reason why I just die, my true why I die, is rooted, is rooted much more in an attempt to try to find and maintain some sanity and balance. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, I've, I've, I've mentioned it in a bunch of our videos. It's really easy to miss because it usually comes out like flippantly and followed by a joke or a laugh to try to soften the blow of the truth a bit. But in six words, it is still to straighten out my crooked dome. That's, that's, that's the truth. <clears throat> the, the, you know, there's all sorts of real deal reasons and just plates of cat shit that life serves us up to eat that any one of them can justifiably make any sane man or woman crazy. And the last thing that I want to do is to compare or rank any of them because they all count. But my plate of cat shit came in the form of having it all. I mean, all of it. I had it all. And then losing it all. Like, all of it. N namely, in the form of my partner in all crime. Man, did she shine. That girl shined. That's pro that's that's probably as far as I can crack that can open with the cameras rolling. It's not what this is about anyway, but I was in a sad state, man. That was me. That was me at my lowest spot. And I was, I was stuck in a funk for a long while. Like a long, a long while. And it didn't matter what it was. Disc golf or kayaking or basketball or hanging out with the boys or really just any form of getting up off of my ass. It was all met with the same two words. What for? Or maybe four words. What the hell for? Because, because fire burns everything around me. And there is no quieting the noise inside of my damned head. So what the hell for? It was a bad spot. <laughs> it was a bad spot. And it's a spot that I, that I know that no matter what flavor of cat shit life has served you up, 
that a lot of people out there can relate with where you just can't quiet the noise inside. There's no escape, not sleep, not nothing. And you can't get away from it. it you know, eventually desperation had me trying anything. And I ended up forcing myself to take the kayak out every night at sunset for many months, many, many months. <laughs> and like floating out there under a different awe-inspiring tapestry night after night after night, like somewhere along the way, the volume just, it just started to turn down a little, just a little, <laughs> but like just enough for me to muster up the motivation to like explore the daylight hours again <laughs> and get out of the cave. It started with like just little busy projects, distraction type stuff. It was just filling time. And then that kind of graduated into bigger projects that felt like more than filling time. Like maybe there was a purpose to this crap I was doing. And then if you fast forward a little while longer, I was buying this camper that I'm sitting here talking to you on for $800 cash <laughs> and then spent the next year or so rebuilding it from the frame up with my hands, like all with the idea that I was going to like take it on the road and just live on the road and escape and just, <laughs> just vanish and disappear into the wilderness or whatever or something. Excuse me. Little did I know, though, that what I was doing at that time was building out my like future T. Diddy studio and headquarters the, <laughs> the whole time. And, you know, I, I was back to disc golfing at this point and actually spending time with real people again. And on this one day, I was hanging out at a bar with my main man, Jojo. The two of us were having a beer and we were writing a list. Jojo loves, <laughs> Jojo loves writing lists. So do I, I'll confess. <clears throat> but this list in particular was for names for the discs in our bag to replace like the stupid stock names that we were tired of, Leopard and Rock and all that stuff. So we wanted some names that had some meaning. And this was maybe because some of the alcohol that was induced, but nonetheless, it was a comprehensive list with many names on it that I could not, should not, would not share with your audience. But, <laughs> <laughs> but <clears throat> like it was the first true inspiration seed that, that blossomed into me becoming a disc dyer down the road. Like I took that list straight home from the bar and pulled out some Sharpies and got to work on all my discs. And I like I went into that trance, like deep enough in where I didn't even realize it, but I, I was rekindling a love affair for art that that hadn't burned in me since like my high school days. Which we, we, we're t <laughs> we're talking way back now. That's from the way back machine. <laughs> but but something just something just clicked back into place. I, I don't know how to fully describe it. And like I've put a ton of thought into it in retrospect because, because like I'd love to know right where that switch is and to be, <laughs> be able to go right for it. But whether it was the level of focus that was required or that hypnotic trance that I was just talking about, or the, the, the feeling of accomplishment that came on the side or all of it piled together, I don't know, but what I did know that it was way different than all the other stuff that I had been like distracting myself with up to this point. And, you know, I sharpied up every one of my damn discs. And, and then, and then just like with disc golfing, I totally stumbled upon disc dying. I was like, wow, like look at the levels that you can take this to. I was just scrolling aimlessly through videos on YouTube like we do and uh, some uh, a video by Die Hard Discs 
popped up. He's he's like the OGist of the YouTube disc dyers. And I was like, damn! Check it out. I, I rolled through his whole catalog of disc dyeing videos. There are maybe 12 of them in there. I'm telling you, you should go check out his stuff. Okay, I don't think he's still making videos, but his old stuff's still up. And you'll definitely see his influence on mine. But like, I went through the whole catalog and, and make 12 videos, like that's all of the disc dyeing videos that were on YouTube back at, <laughs> back at that point. But, but like I said, I, I had already sharpied up all of the discs in my damn bag. So I went, <laughs> I went to eBay and I bought a, a huge box of maybe 50 used discs and I, I, I got to screwing them all up. And maybe half of them, you know, were base grade plastic. And I didn't know any better at the time, you know, that they were just going to like totally reject the die and I was going to have to start all over. But like I got to funkin' those discs up. And by the time I got to the end of that box, I knew it. Like I knew it. Like just like with hawking discs, I, I was hooked on dying them. And I don't, it wasn't because of what I was doing to the discs. It's because of what doing it to them was doing to me. Is that, <laughs> I know, it sounds convoluted and, and, and bass backwards, but like early on, it, that addiction to it was fed simply by just wanting to go back to that place of peace and quiet. See, it's, it's the only one I had. And then frankly, it was more than enough. It was more than enough. But, like, as it started to grow, and, like, w whatever's happening while you're creating, it, like, added with that sense of accomplishment that comes on the other side, like, it was all starting to feel like, I don't know, self-worth maybe? Like, self-love, I guess, if we're being honest. That's what was starting to creep in. And, I don't know, I hadn't felt that since, well, since before. Mm -hmm. Long before. And I don't, I don't remember when, like when I decided to flick on the cameras and turn it all into a YouTube, <laughs> YouTube channel. I think like early on, the inspiration was maybe to supply something for gas money on this like existence on the road that I was about to disappear, <laughs> disappear off onto. But like nonetheless, it happened and with a totally different direction in mind than disc dying but like as that addiction grew like the idea of getting to teach people what i was learning and maybe like just maybe give them a chance to, to reap some of the other benefits th that i was getting out of it like it it, it made it seem like a no-brainer at that point and and you know we didn't grow to thousands and thousands of subscribers just like that <laughs> it was it was a really slow burn in the beginning but but really early on at the start i got a chance to develop r relationships with some of the crazies that made up our early subscribe <laughs> our early subscribers and it opened up my why i die like in a way that i could have never anticipated like somehow the message was getting through it. Like it was getting through my terrible production quality <laughs> and and absolutely cringeworthy on camera discomfort at the time. I hated talking into the camera hole back then. I hated it. But somehow, like a few huckers were getting more than just a disc dying lesson out of our stupid little videos. And if if you want to add a, a, a burgeoning sense of purpose to, to the already peaceful self-worth drug that I was addicted to, the needle's in, damage is done, <laughs> that's it. And like it was around, it was around this point that I was like almost nervously ready to say I was proud of myself again, which I, it, it sounds stupid and sad to say it out loud, but like it was crooked. <laughs> it was, it was, it was crooked. It all, it all kind of climaxed 
about a year and a half ago when I went up to my first pro disc golf tournament at Ledgestone. I rolled up the whole 11 plus hours all by myself in my truck, just jamming out to some bunk the whole, <laughs> the whole way. But despite going up there all by myself, I, I might have spent 10 minutes alone outside of going back to my hotel room for sleep that whole time that I was up there. It was crazy. I, I had no idea what I was getting into when, <laughs> when I went out to this tournament. Just, it, it, I parked my truck on that first day and then took two steps from the door and heard, Hey now, TDD! <laughs> coming, coming from across the row. And dude ran around to the back door of his car and grabbed his dis out and ran over to show off all his dice to me. And Dave, like the look of excitement and pride on his face, I'm telling you, Damn. I mean, it was, it's the second most flattered I've been in all my life. I'm sure of it. And the four days that followed were just chuck filled to the brim with one T. Diddy encounter after another T. Diddy army encounter. It, <laughs> so much more than I could handle. I'm telling you, man, I'm a hermit. I'm a freaking <laughs> recluse. That, like, I have admittedly reinserted myself back into society and started to contribute again and all that kind of stuff. But I spend an absurd amount of time in this exact spot working on discs and videos and all this T. Diddy crap and was in no way ready or, or prepared for the reception that was waiting for me out there. I, I mean, I had like more pictures taken of me in those four days, you know, like with my arm around some awesome TV <laughs> arm general, be like, yeah, yeah. In those, in those four days, then in the previous 14 years that came before them, it, <laughs> it was crazy, crazy, and, and terribly, terribly flattering. <laughs> I wasn't ready for it. I got to have a few extended and more intimate conversations with a few of the huckers out there about the ways my silly little videos had affected them that really that really started to cement and affirm that that sense of pride I was talking about in what I created there was this one particular guy out there I got to talk to his name was Mike total dude Mike and I and his buddy Dustin, we walked off like the whole course together that one day watching the ladies huck discs way better than I, <laughs> than I will ever be able to. It's inhuman. Uh, but we, we, we chewed the fat that whole round together, just sharing stories and getting to know each other. And then towards the end of the round, and this, this is something that I'm never going to forget. He was telling me about how some of the lessons and motivations that he had found in our videos had allowed for him to become a full-time disc dyer and stay-at-home dad. And then this is the part. He looked at me and said, give me a second. <laughs> Bob, your videos have been short allowed me to become a better father. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> I was stunned with humility. I mean, stunned. Like just frozen in time and space, just trying to find a spot to fit that compliment into my you know, broken and crooked dome. It, it was, it was heavy. It, it's still heavy. If you can't, if, if you can't tell. Mm. And Mike, Mike, if you're out there, you know who you are. And, and you know what? Most of the rest of you probably know who he is as well by a different name that I won't share right now because they're he, like, they're one of the most popular and successful brands 
in Bistine, as it were. But that, that conversation, like after that conversation, I was left with no other option but to keep doing it. Like that was it. Because, because it's doing it that did it. Like it's the whole difference. It, like for me, the difference between being a total wreck and whatever it is I am now. <laughs> a total nutbag, maybe, probably, but, but like a much more balanced mix of nuts. And instead of mourning forever, it's starting to feel like carrying a legacy forward and letting her shine again. So that's why I do it. To straighten out my crooked dome. And I keep doing it because it's starting to work. <laughs> and like I said, it, it humbles me and, and makes me incredibly grateful to all of our supporters. Like it's a, it's a real small handful of people that have heard this story before today and know what T Diddy is truly all about. It, it's not a disc dying business or a YouTube channel or a, a catchy slogan. It, it is the actual tangible manifestation of my sanity. And like every one of those nutbags, whether they know it or not, has played a big part in it. It, and I, this feels, I guess, like a good spot to drop like a real sincere thank you to, to any of them that, that might be listening because every one of them has, has helped put a piece back into place of my own, you know, little redemption puzzle. And to think, like to even imagine it, that they could help a couple other huckers out as well, balance out their own bag of mixed nuts <laughs> somehow it makes it makes the keep doing it part that much easier <laughs> makes it it makes it much easier and you know it's funny because it's all an accident the whole damn thing <laughs> the, the 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 wave the winds carried this ship where it ended up i i started off in a totally different direction and and with no idea where, where this all could, could have ended up. It, it's, it's friggin' crazy. Like thousands of nutbags climbing aboard and, and coloring on plastic circles for sanity's sake. That, that's what it is. Oh, and, and maybe some sexy spinners, I guess. But, but, but that's what makes doing it the difference. Like it's, it's all just that first domino. I'm telling you, it's all just knocking over that first domino. Turn the crank. Let the engine run some. See where it takes you. Because for me, it has led me to the thing that I am most proud of now. That all this, the difference is doing its stuff and a, a, a legion of TDD Army nutbags that are that are holding it all up <laughs> it's, it's it's a hell of an accident is what it is <laughs> it's, it's a hell of an accident and like all simply because i i finally decided to get up off my ass and turn the cr crank a couple times again and start the engine back up i'm glad i did it like i'm <laughs> I'm really glad I did it. So, so that's, that is the whole, the difference is doing its story. That's why I do it. That's why I keep doing it. And like to everybody who's allowed, empowered, helped, lifted me up along the way. I can't thank any of them enough. I just can't do it. Like without, without the nutbags, there's no way I am this sane. <laughs> it's, this scene, I know that that is, 
an extremely relative term, but I can attest to the fact that it's been a lot, <laughs> a lot worse. So I guess that's me trying to say thank you. And that is the whole friggin' story, Dave. That's it from top to bottom. I'm glad you shared that story because, you know, people need to hear that because I feel like a lot of people have gone through some similar situations or use disc golf and disc dying to cope with those situations. And um, that's what you did. And a byproduct of that is uh, you put it on video so these other people can um, get that therapy as well and know that they're not alone um, in this. And, you know, I really appreciate that, but that you're not alone is a message that I've gotten over and over again, as other people have interpreted my pain through, you know, just watching my videos religiously, I guess. And the, the, I've connected with loads of people that have, that are a big part of, of what have allowed me to be able to sit here on the camera <laughs> and share all this stuff. I, I, I'd be lying if I didn't say there's not a big part of it that's just for me as well and and my own healing but the idea that it could that it has a chance of of other people relating to it and and finding maybe a little hope as well i'm telling you just turn the crank it works uh that's that's exciting to me so i appreciate and like like i said at the start man i appreciate you letting me using your platform to share it with everybody yeah absolutely um you know, I honestly have learned a lot from your videos. I consider you the uh, the godfather of disc dying, <laughs> teaching, and education. Um, like I said in the beginning, I almost guarantee any dyer has saw your video at some point in time and has learned something. And a thing that I like about you is you're very authentic. You don't put on a face or facade. That's that's you. <laughs> no, um, <I'm> <laughs> And people can relate to that because, you know, people again have the same issues or struggles and just trying to find that creative outlet and, you know, get in the zone. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. It's easy to stay focused when you're chasing sanity. That's yes. <laughs> it's easy to stay focused on the goal. <clears throat> yes. Um, and I appreciate you being on here and sharing your story. Um <laughs> I got to find a good segue now to go into my normal, normal. No, I'm excited to get into the rest of the questions too. I've watched a bunch of your other episodes with Kateri and, uh, you know, all those other people. And like, I'm amped to get into all of the regular questions that don't have the potential for me, maybe falling into waterworks along the way. So <laughs> if you just need a transition, I'll be happy to say it. Yo, let's hit that other stuff too, dog. That's why I came. Yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, I know you kind of spoke on this uh, in the beginning, um, but just we'll go read over the questions. Uh, do you remember the first disc that you died or a couple of discs that you died? Oh, ab absolutely. Um, the first disc that I actually died, like with actual dye <laughs> instead of all my creative Sharpie colorings and that kind of stuff, I, it was a... It was a star AVR and it was a spin die. And I saw like a guy just do a cool, like splatter looking glue mask kind of thing. And the very first one I did was actually a glue mask. It's, it's a good five plus years old now. So it has like the die has totally migrated and faded into the plastic. For the most part, you can almost see the design better on the underside of the disc now <laughs> than you can, you know what I'm talking about. Some of yeah, you know yeah. what I'm talking about. Um, then on the top. So I have, uh, along with the other like four or five discs that I first had, my first bed die and all that kind of crap. I've done a couple live streams where like the idea of them was what to do when it starts to fade and that there's, there's, there's poetry in that as well. And then to die like another phase of something over top of it that works with the old faded one and, and, you know, kind of complements the new one as well. So I, I've re-dyed that first disc. I think I did that one in a live stream too. And actually it was long enough that the second die has started <laughs> to migrate to the, <laughs> to the bottom side as well. So I 100% remember it. You know, I have pictures 
Um, that's what my, my screensaver is a lot of time. It's just rolling. I know that sounds arrogant, doesn't it? Rolling through <laughs> some of my old n- <laughs> nostalgic dyes and that kind of stuff. So heck yeah, I remember it, man. Yeah, I guess I'm a relatively new dyer and my dyes are starting to fade. So I haven't had the chance to re-dye them, but, uh, that is a, an interesting thing to do. Uh, and I want to get your perspective because you've been dying for a while now. And when you first started, there was not a whole lot of information to do stuff. Um, I know you said you watched that, uh, a handful of YouTube videos of that one guy. Die hard discs, die hard discs. Where yeah. else did you get your information of how to die a disc and, or yeah, there was like hell? maybe two or three other random videos on YouTube at that point that like I gleaned them from. There, there was also like a couple Reddit boards and <clears throat> what was the other, um, disc golf review, uh, dot com had a couple forums as well that I got some good information on back then, but really you know, like I said, that box of 50 used discs that I got, that was it, man. That was the answer. I tell people to do that all the time when they're like, I'm going to try this. Like, yo, just buy a big box of used discs and screw them all up. Every one of them. You'll figure out, <laughs> you'll figure out everything you need to. So I, I busted, busted through all of them. I know that one of the questions <clears throat> that you've asked other people is like one of the things that you would change from the beginning if you could. <laughs> um, all of this, like I said, was for the sake of my sanity. So yeah. like the journey is where I found that and I probably wouldn't mess with that. But that said, like had I started dyeing with actual poly dyes instead of leather dyes, mm-hmm. like I, I would have covered a ton more ground. One of those other videos that I found on YouTube showed using uh, Thebing's leather dye on discs and was getting like jet black, triple jet black, 8K mm. black. And I was like, yo, I'm using that. It's not made for plastics. <laughs> it's just not. Mm-hmm. So I spent the better part of a year on the struggle bus trying to figure out how to get that stuff to work good. And eventually I figured it out, but it's a damn mess. Mm. And like as soon as I switched over <clears throat> to poly dyes and hot dipping, like things super accelerated for me and and like that's at that point at least in my journey like that's when there actually was a community of disc dyers starting to form like the facebook group group was Mm -hmm. in its infancy at that point and you know my facebook group had gotten a couple hundred people at least enough where like i could start to take advantage of it and share you know glean some information out of these people Mm -hmm. because you know i'm not an artist I didn't go to art school or anything like that. I, I, I'm, I'm like a, a craftsman. Uh, so, but really more than, more than the resources that I went to. And I'm telling you, Die Hard Disc, he's a, he had a bunch of di- videos that were way different than everybody else's and had some killer techniques way early in the game. He was way ahead of the game. Hmm. Um, but really the secret was getting a big damn box of discs and just screwing them all up. Yeah. Getting at them. Um, and then, you know, coming out the other side feeling confident. Like you, like you, I don't know. I just haven't, there are a few ways to screw things up that I just haven't stumbled into already. <laughs> now, <laughs> now I know that when I get to them, like I've already practiced a way to try to cover it up or try to erase it or blend it in so that it kind of looks like I meant to do it. And then, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> it's, that's, that's where, that's where all of my, my confidence comes from now. Yeah. I fixed all the mess ups once. (laughs) (laughs) And I've mentioned this before, you know, that's how you learn is you make mistakes and you learn from those mistakes. And the more mistakes you learn or do, the more you learn and the better you get. Yeah. Eating failure is my superpower. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Do you remember specifically the first dye that you tried using? Like I got a batch of eye dye poly and Mm. I got some black and a couple other colors. Uh, but the, the Phoebe's leather dye I, is where I started for using stencils. Like when I was using the eye dye poly, I started, and again, this is way back in the day. This is before people were, way before Floetrol and everybody was saying that you can't do glue beds because it eats up the dye and it'll never transfer. You know, now clear glue beds or everything, mm-hmm. right? Um, but way before all that, and this is back when, like the only way that people would do stuff back then was shaving cream right that was it that's where it all started 
So I was using the eye dye to just sprinkle on shaving cream and make funky designs. But the Thebing's leather dye is all I was using for stencils. And I loved doing the stencils, you know, and kind of personalizing them that much more. But it's crap. It's not me. I mean, it's not crap. It's great for leather. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's crap for the plastic unless you want to deal with an absolute mess. I will say this. Like I have, look at this. This is a Phoebe's leather dye dye that I did an age ago. Hmm. And that sucker hasn't faded at all, has it? That's I impressive. I mean, it is still as black as black gets. Yeah. Hmm. So, like, it, when you do figure out how to use it, if you care to deal with the friggin' mess that it creates and how careful you have to be trying to dye around it and not smear it, man, it lasts forever. <laughs> but, but don't do it. Just get, some, <laughs> just get some of the good stuff. Like, and there was no pro chem at that time either. There was just, uh, I died. But eventually I learned about worm dip and I started with spike it worm dip, which is pretty good. But then I learned about quick coat worm dip and I was like, whoa, the saturation with this is way better. And mm -hmm. I loved it. I, I still love it. It's one of my favorites. It's so clean and just set to jet right out of the bottle. It's never a mess. It, it, it's just easy for me. But it, it eventually, you know, when ProChem came in, now I'm dealing with ProChem and I got all every flavor of RIT down there under my table. Like, there's no question that ProChemical and dye yields the best saturation at this point. They know what they're doing. They got the mix. But more than that, like I really like having all of them, you know, that make up the whole palette because anybody who does this knows that one red's different than the other red that's different than the other red. And mm -hmm. there's a total palette that they all make up that like I feel like if people are going to get into this, spend a couple of ducats, get them all. <laughs> get every color, every flavor. Do you have a current favorite color dye that you like to use? This leads to another question that I've heard you ask before in that the, one of the harder parts of disc dyeing for me is that I am full spectrum colorblind. Full spectrum colorblind people typically don't have favorite colors per se. Huh. <laughs> I don't have a favorite. Like I don't I don't give a damn on my own disc obviously. But I do like really care to get the colors right on all the commission work that I do. I have a couple friends that get the obligatory, can you please tell me what colors these are? <laughs> <laughs> thing. And everything that I use, like in all the other types of containers that I transfer things into, like I have systems that have been in play for 40 some years now for marking and making sure that I'm using the right colors and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> but that was one of the things that like when I was starting a disc dyeing channel that I was thinking to myself, yo, they got to <laughs> think to themselves, if this colorblind fool can pull this off, I know that I can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> know that I can. So I, I don't, I guess like my favorite colors have been in the blues and greens area growing up, but yeah. <laughs> My favorite, my favorite when I'm dying is the one that I get right. Yeah, yes. Makes sense. So the one that I get right. I know you mentioned stencils. What got you into stencils? And I'm obviously highly assuming that you were hand cutting your stencils. In the very beginning, I did a lot of hand cutting. I didn't get a machine for a while. Um, and you know, obviously when you're hand cutting, you're starting out with, with simple stuff. Um, but you know, just a desire to want to do it and to get at it and to try it. So, um, like I, w what I would do was I would print out like something that I wanted to stencil. And then like the one thing I am good with art is like sketching, drawing, pencil, drawing, that kind of stuff. And I could take a pen and like it, but only with stuff that I'm looking at. Like I can't just draw from my brain. All mm -hmm. right. <laughs> I have to be looking at it, but if I am, I can do it. I can like replicate it, not replicate, but you know what I'm talking about. Nonetheless, I would print it out and then set it right there. And then I would draw like with pen on the, the vinyl, obviously, cause you can't do it with pencil and then transfer it over and then hand cut it right on the disc. Um, and like taught myself as I was screwing up my way through all those 50 discs, like the, the torque or pressure that it requires to cut through 
the vinyl and not into the plastic and through like the, the contact paper and all that stuff. Um, I can't lie to you, man. I freaking hated hand cutting. I <laughs> hated it. Not just because it was so arduous, but because like it was frustrating to me to be like, to have my drawing be so good on the vinyl and then my hand cutting be so bad because it's not a pencil, the blade, yes. you know, it doesn't like yeah. move left and right or anything like that. You have to be turning it the whole time. So like eventually, and, and like I cut my, I cut the, the hell out of my hands, man. Mm -hmm. I had non stop cuts, but eventually like it was that frustration that had me bust through the seal and get a machine. And my first machine I got on eBay, it was a used uh, silhouette machine that mm -hmm. I got for 50 bucks. It came with three mats and like a whole buttload of extra vinyl and rolls and that kind of stuff. And I like I, I worked that machine out. Like I put hundreds of stencils through those through those 50 bucks. And like the only downside of that and I loved the silhouette machine and I loved the silhouette software probably more than the cricket software. I don't, I'm not trying to go down that road because I know that's a, <laughs> um, <laughs> how many times I've lost the internet and had my damn <laughs> cricket drawing disappear. <laughs> but, um, I put hundreds of, of stencils through that machine, but the only downside was, and I didn't know any better at the time when I was buying it from it, buying it, it had an eight inch wide tray, eight, eight inch wide tray. So it was like eight and a half mm. by 11 inch mat. So the vinyl that I was printing out on it wasn't big enough to like wrap around the disc. It was only big enough to make a stencil that would fit on the, you know, everything I printed would fit on the disc, mm -hmm. which for that first, you know, year or so where I was using the Phoebe's leather dye, it wasn't a huge deal because I wasn't hot dipping it where it would like spill over the sides where the vinyl wasn't or anything like that. I was just, you know, painting it on top with a brush straight out of the bottle. Um, but then at what were like right when I made that switch to poly dyes, I'm like, I'm hot dipping. I was like, as soon as I started hot dipping, the silhouette machine wasn't cutting it anymore because the vinyl wouldn't wrap yeah. around to the backside of the disc. So it's at that point that I got the Cricut machine that I have now, which is an Explore Air. And making the switch from hand cutting to a machine all, all the way back when, it was a total game changer at the time. Total game changer. And I'm not going to say it was the same when I jumped up from the silhouette to the cricket, but like I, I definitely didn't hate the weeding of vinyl <laughs> <laughs> or loathe. Maybe that's a much better word to say. I didn't loathe the weeding of vinyl in the same way that I did the hand cutting. For, you yeah. know, I wasn't cutting the crap out of myself, mm -hmm. um, but I was able to like find that Zen spot like that trance of falling into the moment where it's just you and the vinyl and a blade which sounds existential and stupid but 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 that's where the noise quizzes it's in the moment it's deep in the moment um and that <clears throat> like that zen spot uh, of those crazy detailed stencils you know as all that matured that's that's what what uh, started to attract me to it mm. um and those those long crazy hour after hour weeding sessions and stuff that that's the one thing that I know I've, I, I guess if I've earned a reputation for some kind of style or whatever, it's some of the more ridiculous stencils. My thought on that is always like, who cares? It's picking out final. Mm -hmm. Um, but that, that patient zenful spot, that's, that's what draws me into it. So for your stencils, uh, where do you get your artwork and do you do any manipulation or addition or subtraction to the stuff that you find or do you create anything? Yeah, I have a couple subscriptions for some of the images that I pull, uh, like Shutterstock and that kind of stuff. I use that for things like the giveaways that we do every month and that kind of stuff because I don't... I have accidentally slipped down the wrong side of the slope of screwing up with copywritten stuff before. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'll, I'll tell a quick story with that. Like I did a disc with um, Brian Allen's artwork on it and credited him and, and sent it to him and all that kind of stuff. And he's like, dude, you totally screwed up. 
Like, I don't own that image anymore. Even if you gave me all the damn credit, I sold the license to that image to someone else, and now you've potentially compromised it. And I was like, holy shit, I was trying... So I like I don't mess with that stuff. You guys shouldn't either. Okay, be careful. Yeah. Um, so I have a, a few subscriptions that, that I use for images th to buy for that kind of to put it on. You know, most of the work that I do uh, for disc dyeing, like I said, we're not we're a disc dyeing business. Buy discs from us, okay? That's what I do. <laughs> it's still a disc dyeing business, um, but but most all of the discs that I do are commission work with specific requests where people say, can you do this for me? Can you do that for me? Can you do this for me? And the very large majority of them, people are sending me images or drawings that they did themselves or that kind of stuff to put on the disc. I, I will <clears throat> design a stencil, so to speak, for people if they just want to give me an idea. Um, I'm not a graphic artist by any means. Uh, you know, I'm not a video editor by any means either or any of this crap. <laughs> I just kind of learning it all as I go. But um, I, I, I'm starting to get pretty good in Photoshop and Premiere and like the little bit of uh, artistic ability I have, I've used to kind of just like cobble some things together myself. Um, but, you know, so many of my ideas come from like all these nutbags in the TDD army, there's, we have a hashtag that we started on Instagram, hashtag TDD army that people will put on, you, you know, discs that they post up so that everybody can see them. There's, I don't know, like 16 or 17,000 posts on there or something. <laughs> it's what it is, is an infinite supply of, of muse and inspiration. Um, <clears throat> so even though I'm still kind of like, I, I totally suck at social media and I'm maybe a little anti like that is one of the few places that I go on the regular and just scroll through and look for mm -hmm. ideas like that last um, I don't know if it was the last one or the one before but the the one live stream we did with like the spill spin where it looks like something spilling over a spin die mm -hmm. like that was from a kind of disc that I saw from another TDD army general just scrolling through and you know looking at how many cool artists are, tag <laughs> are tagging their pictures with that. I, but, but like I said in the beginning, especially like if you're trying to do this for real, buy a subscription to get pictures that aren't going to get you in trouble when you're, when you're using them. Yeah. It's, uh, it's easy. It's easy to screw that up. Okay. Yeah. We all get it. You definitely have to be careful with that. Um, even though if you're small and you know, whatever you, you may not get caught, but you know, even Don't. if you're trying not to do it, you can do it by accident sometimes. Yes. Like, you got to be careful. Mm -hmm. You got to make sure you're not. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, just do all your own network, then skip the middleman. Mm -hmm. uh, what, uh, what got you into hot dipping? Like, what triggered that and what made you start doing that? I don't know what was what it was that keyed me off to it. I, like I said earlier, I know that was around the time when... <clears throat> the community was starting to grow to a point where there was like like some real group think going on and and a lot of good ideas getting bounced around at, at a much faster rate you know much faster rate than ever before so i'm sure that i just saw some other some other person do it and was like what the hell have i been doing this whole time because like the other thing is that takes 10 minutes mm -hmm. <laughs> come on because like the phoebe's leather dye like it would take however long to paint it on, but then like it would dry in an hour or two or sometimes three, but it took like a full day or two for it to cure <laughs> because that kind of dye needs to cure. It's not made for plastic. So like I, that was one of the things that I remember. I was like, man, it's like 10 times cleaner. You, you don't have a, like, you don't have to be super careful afterwards reactivating it. And mm. it only takes 10 minutes to get jet black. Um, so I'm sure it was from seeing some other fool do it and being just like, holy crap, I got the eye dye here. I'm going to buy a skillet. But I have learned since then, <clears throat> as I've gotten into the more crazy detailed stencils, that like I, I've had to learn other ways that aren't as susceptible to bleeding as hot dipping mm -hmm. and, and loosening the itty bitty tiny piece of adhesive that's left on the itty bitty tiny piece of vinyl that's on the disc. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. I mean, 
that it, you know that there's not enough vinyl there to hold up to 125 degree water. So, mm -hmm. like I've I've learned a bunch of other ways, like lotion topping and that the detergent mix that Kateri taught me from This Is How I Die is like one of my go tos now. I have a super rich black uh, detergent mix that I use in place of hot dips because it's it's just so much more viscous, you know, and not heated. It isn't mm -hmm. going to destroy the super stencils. So it's continued to mature, <clears throat> excuse me, to mature since then. Um, but that was, I, I don't remember the spot, but I remember the thinking right then. Mm -hmm. 10 minutes, no mess. Let's do this. <laughs> yeah. I remember, you know, I was researching different dye techniques and I saw the hot dipping and it only took, you know, 10 minutes. I'm like, I like that because I can do that yeah. fast. Um, so you were talking about, you know, that you do commission discs has there been any weird or interesting commissions that you've had or done? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the weirdest or maybe the weirdest feeling disc that I've had to die recently and I've had to die a few of these is my cartoon Hey Nowing face. <laughs> <laughs> Which, <laughs> listen, it's my own damn fault we just released recently a, a signature series of tdd designs and one of them is me hey nowing the camera like i do in my <clears throat> at the start of my videos and mm -hmm. i don't know why people want my goofy mug on their driver i don't understand but like i i wouldn't have believed any of this crap a long time ago so <laughs> that's that's probably the weirdest i've done three or four of my hey nowing face i i have also had to do, had to is maybe a little bit rough term. I've also done a number of R and X rated discs, which like dying private parts in detail is pretty weird. Okay. That's probably, that's probably as far as I want to take that one. Yeah. But I've died a bunch of weird ones. Yes. Well, <laughs> My face is still the weirdest though. I'm still getting over that. I'm, I'll never get over that. How, I guess, how did the <clears throat> Hey Now basically become your signature? I, I, all of those silly catchphrases just kind of materialized on their own. Now, Hey Now is a greeting that I have used with my friends for years. I was a, I'm, I'm not a big Howard Stern fan. It's more from Larry Sanders back, way back in the day, but it has just generically been. Hey now, my greeting for people for a long time. It turning into the characterization that, <laughs> that it is now in all my videos. I, I don't know how it escalated like it did. It's like a game now for me to be <laughs> as ridiculous as I can to the point where I crack myself up. Okay, because I know that just as valuable as the hey now laughing at my own dumb ass is a good <laughs> is a good way to start things out and every one of them really is just that me laughing at the total nutbag characterization that the hey now has become at the beginning of my videos that i know is weird but i know that people are kind of waiting and expecting <laughs> 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 waiting for it. and really <clears throat> It's the same with all like the downtown boomtown and heartbreaker and all that kind of stuff. That, that now those actually maybe a little bit different. They sort of just materialized on their own. You know the other one that did was the TDD Army. I don't even remember where that came from. It just mm. like it just happened, uh, and all of a sudden there was like a whole buttload of people holding up discs, going check this one out. <laughs> it's crazy, but. The, the, the hey now itself has many years of, many years of practice. Nothing like the characterization it is now, but many years of practice long before the difference is doing it. <laughs> so anybody out there that's doing a legacy, make sure you like what you're doing because you never know what might catch on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, you know, felt awesome. So I, I stuck with it, I guess. <laughs> there you go. Do you think that you have a signature style or die method? Um, for my view, I feel like you do it all and you always are continuing to improve to do different things. And I 
necessarily can't nail one thing down, but is there one thing in your mind? I've pretty much always been a jack of all trades, master of none, mm-hmm. long, long, long before disc golf. And like you said, you know, we're, <clears throat> I, I, I've been like consciously trying to cover as many different techniques and styles as I can, one way or another. Like if I don't know how to do it, then I try to bring someone else in who can, like because we're a disc dying YouTube channel. And, mm-hmm. you know, that and I don't know, probably the reason why it's always been the jack of all trades master is none is because I have an easy time getting bored with stuff. Like once I figured it out, I want to move on to the next one, you know, and, <laughs> and start banging out another. But like I do at this point now, um, I, I feel blessed. I'm, I'm happy that I have a full quiver, you know, of arrows to pull out whenever I need to. And, mm-hmm. and forcing myself to get out of my comfort zone after like I figured something out that I I knew that I could use to make a dope die anytime Mm -hmm. but then switching to something else that I there was a good chance I was going to screw up you know and and forcing myself out of that zone where I knew what I was doing to learn something else has gotten me to a point where like you know I got a full quiver and it feels it feels kind of awesome um there was a point where That same dude that I was telling you about earlier, Mike from, uh, from Ledgestone. Another thing he said to me that really stuck was, you know, I was telling him about like the, the sense of responsibility that, that T Diddy started to feel like. It was something that I, I didn't anticipate. And he looked at me, he's like, Bob, you've taught more people how to die this than anybody in the world. And I was like, oh, <laughs> you know what? At this point, you're probably right. <laughs> That's weird as hell. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's weird as hell. But there was like a, like what I was confessing to him, I guess, was there was like I was already starting to feel whatever weight came with that mm-hmm. uh, of trying to stay on top of yeah. <clears throat> the next style it, 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 and it, not not to necessarily be raising the bar. Like I know with certainty that I am nowhere near like nowhere near the top 10% of artists in this community. There's way more in the TDD army that would just embarrass my disc guys. Like to at least stay with the bar mm-hmm. and, and to give people a place to go where they knew that they could, they could keep getting something new. Um, and if there wasn't more new out there and, and I just got bored, it would have, you know, it would have ran out. There's, I, there's still just, I feel like there's still just as much out there to learn as I already have. Yeah, there's uh, a million ways you can do something. And I feel like uh, your community inadvertently has pushed you probably farther than you would have done on your own to try new things and experiment, which I think is awesome. Hell yeah. Without the nut bags, there's none of it. (laughs) So let's talk more about your die station. Uh, How you kind of touched on it before, but how did this all come about of your die station and it is it's crammed into a tight space in my little camper the camper itself is seven by 13 like length by width it's it's tall enough for me to stand up but i'm not working with a ton of space now it's out here in the camper for a number of reasons one is like i I love the outside and it it's a part of my sanity i've learned (laughs) i've learned that so i love being outside also I struggle with migraines. That's one of the things that I wrestle with from time to time. Mm. And like, I'm serious about ventilation Mm -hmm. and at all times, even through the winter, when I am out here on the camper, I got windows open and exhaust fans on. And like, I joke about sniffing acetone, but I don't mess with it. Mm -hmm. I don't mess with it because not because of like the long term stuff and all that, but because like it can trigger a headache that'll put me down for a whole day. And I'm not, mm. I'm not trying to mess with that. So like outside on the camper, it seemed like the only place, you know, when I got this thing, it was kind of a broken down piece of crap and I <laughs> rebuilt it right back up from the bottom. Um, and like this whole side over here where the table is, it's like a hundred percent disc dying. And then like just enough room on the table on the other side for me to nestle my laptop into as well here here's what i'll try to do 
I'm gonna try. <laughs> I'm gonna try to give you two views that'll crack you up. Well, one will crack you up. Okay. One is you know everybody's seen down here. You know the the turntable it's still right in front of me, but if you look up at the ceiling, you can see. Nice. Look at this. This is this is a guitar stand or guitar holder that I built into my ceiling because it was the only place I could fit the guitar out of my camper that I jerry-rigged some PVC and stuff to that you can see my camera hanging from. And that is the cam <laughs> that is the camera that points down and like does all the recording from right above. I probably shouldn't have this camera hanging there when I'm not using it. It's like a $2,500 camera that was gifted to me. But, <clears throat> you know, because the ceiling is only six and a half feet high, mm -hmm. like I can use it instead of a tripod to rig something up there. And I have, I have manipulated this space. It is extremely well planned and thought out, but I have manipulated it into my tight little distance spot. There's one other like thing that I have that makes it all so possible. It's so risky to pick it up. Like I have this, you, you, everybody sees it in my videos. There it is, it's my my dye mm. brush and, and, and bottle holder and spinner. Mm -hmm. That thing is the dopest. It was made for me by Josh over, my main man Josh over at Apocalypse Disc Dyes. Shout out Josh, he's such a dude, but like, how tight this keeps everything and it's also i don't know it makes the colorblind part a little easier because it keeps mm -hmm. all the colors in their color spot with the color brushes and the colors are on the colors and i don't have to ever worry about mixing up the damn colors um but this little sucker this makes it this is a big piece of what makes it all possible um also using my turntable as a workspace like way more than just for disc dyeing Mm -hmm. But outside of hot dipping, it's it's me and the turntable. At all. We have a special relationship. I got this thing. <laughs> I got this thing. I, I saved it from a <clears throat> a neighbor's flooded basement, and I had to tinker it back into working. Or it's on its second life too, <laughs> mm -hmm. and has been with me here since day one. I love it, but using the turntable and I turned the lid into a light box that I, you know, I put it on and put the lights underneath it shines right through using this as, as my workspace for everything. Um, you know, has, has been a big piece of making it all fit as well. But I spend, like I said, an absurd amount of time right here where you're looking at me <laughs> tucked into this little corner of my camper. I do have like a TV over there that I'll throw up some sports or music on while I'm jamming, but I think the rest of the camper, I'm going to leave them, excuse me, leave a mystery. You know? <laughs> uh, one question that I have, do you have running water out there? Not on the camper, but I'm, you know, it's, it's out in the yard uh, up mm -hmm. next to the house. Um, you know, like I said, my at one point I was planning on disappearing and vanishing onto the road. <laughs> road. I, I still have aspirations for travel and lots yeah. of it. And at some phase of my life, there will be more than just a significant amount of time spent on the road. But that is the one part of this operation that I don't think that I can replicate, at least in this camper, is all of the water mm. that it requires. Like the energy and the power, especially with some of the solar solutions that I put in, like I, I, I think that I could take care of, but the water is is the one thing. Now, when I was rebuilding this camper, I did strip out all of the old copper plumbing and re, re rewire it with a water pump and all that kind of stuff. So I built mm -hmm. everything in. It's got its own little shower and turlet and all that kind of crap. But, um, I haven't, uh, because I don't want to have to winterize it. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I tested the water once and then emptied it. And then that was, you know, that was that until it, until it's on the road. Um, so everything goes inside to the utility sink in the basement when it's time for water. So is the trailer still road worthy? For sure, I could hitch it and take it to the shop and make sure that it's road worthy. <laughs> <laughs> but it has it it hasn't been garaged for years. It's been out in the yard in my yard's woods, mm -hmm. like for for real woods in the front. So like the undercarriage definitely needs some attention. Um 
it, it's a high low my camper which is an extremely old they don't even make them anymore hard top convertible camper that mm -hmm. when you're in travel the top like by hydraulic pressure slides down and totally fits over and covers the bottom mm -hmm. and then when you're out of travel you know it, it lifts back up mm. um those hydraulics require attention <laughs> ongoing attention that they haven't gotten for a while and i'd be a little nervous about taking it down the first time but i'm sure that i can get it to the shop for just like a quick 500 dollars yo make sure she's ready to go mm -hmm. and it would be good but like before things turned into full t diddy studio mode out here um you know everything i was doing with it was for the purpose of making it robe worthy and i got it there right yeah. to the, you know right right to its spot mm -hmm. um, but it's it hasn't been on the road in several years i'm scared to look at the undercarriage and see, what it, <laughs> see what it looks like every once in a while i can hear like a squirrel or a chipmunk scurrying around <laughs> in the pipes and stuff, <laughs> trying to find a little home and i kind of just stomp on the ground some and make <laughs> make them scurry off so it's maybe a little more one with nature than i would like but yeah, she's robe. She's robe worthy. You need to uh, do a T Diddy, -diddy uh, road show, go around mm. the country, and that would be awesome. That is that is definitely part of the big the the big dream. I would love to just start hitting some disc golf courses, hooking up with some nut bags, hucking them. You know, maybe dying some discs or whatever, and then roll into another spot, try it all again. That is definitely part of the grand plan. What uh, I guess? Later. <clears throat> what's stopping you now from doing that? I have reprioritized a little bit, and one of them right now is the family that I have, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to spend as much time with them as I can, at least as much, you know, quality time. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm, it's, it's coming in spurts. Um, eventually, like I said, there will be a phase where it's more full time, but. You know, my moms and, and them are awesome. My sister's got a full family of little rug rats that, like, I'll say it, I'm their favorite uncle, so. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, my pops and all them and, and that stuff. A after getting all the way back out of the cave and, and, and getting a chance to, like, think straight and resort my priorities again, mm -hmm. those have shifted towards the top. It, it is the relationships in my life that mean more than anything to me. So absolutely proximity yeah. is a big, is a big part of those relationships that I'm trying to preserve for a bit. Mm -hmm. When slash if you do hit the road, do you have a first spot that you would like to go to? You know, when I fantasized about it, it was always just like taking off with no destination in mind. Yeah. Right. And just mm -hmm. turning the key and rolling and seeing where I ended up. When the time comes, I, I like I think just for the sake of ceremony, if nothing else, that might that might be how it starts. Uh, but I did get to spend a good amount of time living on the West Coast in all of my travels. I lived in San Diego and Los Angeles, and spent a good amount of time in the Dakotas and Vegas. And I lived in Phoenix. I mean Tempe, right outside of Phoenix for a while. And like I loved it on the West Coast. I loved it out there. I, I'm a Philly boy, go birds, and I will be till the day I die. But like the people out there were just so different and laid back. Like you didn't feel like you had to look over your shoulder all the mm -hmm. time, and it was just so much more chill. And I, I like I really, really dug that. If you want to take it to the next level, like on my honeymoon, I went out to Hawaii, and the people out there, like whew, I almost threw everything up in the air and said, "Screw it, we're not going <laughs> anywhere else." <laughs> Because these people are it. Like they, here, here was my theory. It was so beautiful out there that you are forced to commune with the land in a way that you don't in other places. Hmm. And everybody out there is forced to do it. And, and it makes them commune with each other in a next level way that doesn't happen on the mainland. Like that, that was the nth degree of it. But so I, I've already had a phase where for work, I traveled all over the country. I mean, I did St. Louis and Kansas City and all over the East Coast and the Northeast and Orlando and, and, and Jacksonville. I mean, I've been, I've done a bunch of, I've done a bunch of travel. Um, but like when the time comes where I'm just like taken off, 
I think I'm going to let the compass guide me on the first trip. <laughs> right on. Just set the old school compass on the dashboard and be like, you know what? How about west? Let's go that way. Because uh, the people are way cooler most of, the, <laughs> most of the time. What have you done in your previous life for work? And what do you currently do for work? Well, currently my, my primary income is the, all this T. Diddy garbage. I, I do have other, you know avenues to cash that I take advantage of here and there. But this is primarily where it's all coming from. In my previous life, way back when, I used to, with my lady, own a outsourced sales office where I hired and trained salespeople and then sold them off. Well, not sold them, but more rented them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to other companies to handle all of their outsourced sales. And these, well, like right now we're talking about the worst of salespeople, those face-to-face -face people that would just come and open your business and walk in and start to try to sell you, <laughs> sell you something. And I did that. <clears throat> that, that's a, that is a full story in itself that I won't crack into. Um, I had a really good face of the operation working with me up at the front desk and we were very successful for a while, very successful and way too young. We got into some ducats. Um, and eventually because I, I didn't have the right help behind me, you know, it fell apart because I was a stupid idiot. Um, and then <clears throat> I, you know, I went and picked up some other like just sales jobs where I didn't have to manage people and all that kind of stuff. And I did that, for as long as I could stomach it, really. Um, I, I was I was really good at it. It was super easy. Um, but even when like I was selling something that didn't feel like I was selling something that was crap, like it was still the game. And like I just I just hated playing it after a while. And then, you know, like after everything just exploded I, I took a good amount of time off and then decided like there is no way that I can get back into a profession where I have to interact with people face to face. <laughs> I can't do it. The other thing I've done like all my life on the side, just because I love it is bartend. I bartended for, for years on end, but that was another thing that I just was like, you know what? Screw that. I can't serve two people in love. There's not <laughs> no freaking <laughs> chance. Oh, <sighs> screw that. So <clears throat> after taking, a little break, the next like phase of my career, I decided I wanted to work with my body and I got into exterior construction and I did that for years after that. Climbing ladders and building grooves and gutters and siding and all that, that kind of stuff. I used to, in college, with a bunch of buddies, get myself into trouble by climbing. I had, I had one of my next door neighbors in the dorm was like a way better climber than everybody else. And we never should have gone climbing with him, <laughs> but we did. And, you know, after a while I got good enough to hang, but, um, like I loved getting up high on the bill, like commercial buildings and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff that were yeah. super high. Um, there's that, that's another place where there is, it's so separate. There's, there's another, there's another one of those, it's not the same, but it's similar. That same piece that's out on the water in the sunset all by yourself. And the water's just friggin' huge. And you're this tiny little dot. Like there's some of that same, that same piece up high on the mm -hmm. roof where, where like it's you and the birds and the clouds and you can see forever. <laughs> but I, I worked my body. This was, I was probably too old in this phase of my life to start carrying monster ladders and doing all this kind of stuff and it beat my body up pretty good. Yeah. Um, but, <clears throat> but I loved my little construction phase and that is what like bled right into T Diddy from there. I, I had, I was working for a company doing roofs and gutters and things just weren't going well with the boss. He was a bit of a, bit of a bag. After, <laughs> sorry. After he asked me to work Saturdays for free, I was like, you know what, dude, mm -hmm. I'm out of here. Yeah. And then like that, it was that moment where I was like, you know what? I got to make this T-Diddy stuff work because <laughs> now's the time. I ain't got another one. 
Um, so that, you know, that, like that led right to the transition of starting to do this full time. And, you know, I had a, a bit of a, it took a while to get onto the plus side uh, yeah. of, of this business. Um, and I was lucky to have had a, a bit of a nest egg to, to, to carry me through some of it and get me there. But, um, but it was just enough to get to the plus side. <laughs> Get so to the plus side. when did you start doing this full time and, you know, just quitting your job? Maybe like four years ago, somewhere around there, maybe somewhere hmm. between there and three years ago, hmm. somewhere. Nice. And like I said, you know, I still, I, I mean, I'm like the handyman guy in the neighborhood. So I do a bunch of those side jobs and I still pick up like sales consulting gigs when, like when the money's too, too good to turn down, um, because I can do that stuff well. Mm -hmm. Um, so like I have other irons, so to speak, in the fire if I need to warm something up. Um, but, but I don't know, T diddy has been doing it for a minute now. And like, I, I'd spend most of my days doing, you know, the stuff that, that keeps me happy and sane. And I, I, I don't know, I'm not saving tons, but like, I'm, I'm making more than my nut and, you know, packing a little bit away enough to, the, enough that it feels like, yeah, I'm going to keep doing this for a while. <laughs> at least yeah. until it stops working <clears throat> that's awesome that you can do this full time um now that you are doing it full time and it's work is it becoming less enjoyable now that's a good question you know i did have a phase where instead of doing commissioned work i i was doing like the the production line routine and just mm. cranking out mad dies for you know retailers are just throwing up on the site like it, it it didn't it's at some point it didn't it wasn't feeling like therapy anymore and it did it was the first time that it started to feel like a little like work and stress so like as soon as i sniffed that out i was like oh no no i'm not i can't that's i can't. the business isn't what's important here i can't go down that that road that's not why i'm doing this um, and you know, honestly now it's, it's, I can't remember when the last time is that I've caught up to my waiting list. So like, I've pretty much always for, at least for as long as I can remember now had at least a disc or two out in front of me to work, you know, on my sanity with. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so that routine has been working for a while, but that was the only spot. And I'm, you know, I'm not saying anything about that, that, you know, those designs, those tripped out designs are awesome. I still love them, but like that, that routine just, it wasn't, it wasn't doing it for me. So if you do something and it becomes work, you can lose the passion. And I definitely don't want to do that. Definitely don't want you to do that, which obviously you realize that now. So, uh, I know you've made a lot of mistakes. Is there a single mistake or a few mistakes that stood out to you? um as something pivotal or a turning point for you i really like mixing up my custom colors in dixie cups i got my little thing of dixie cups right here i probably should have changed away from that a long time ago because dixie cups are really easy to knock over and i have knocked over an unlimited number of dixie cups that are filled with dianastone in fact just the other day when I was working on the disc for the raffle that, that I did for your podcast here, <clears throat> I had like a bluish green color that I was, that I had mixed up, probably a little more acetone in there than it needed. And I bumped it with my hand and not only did it spill on the disc, but all over my damn sweatshirt, my hand was totally covered in like a brand new color and it got all over my face and into my beard. <laughs> Oh boy. And like enough of it in my mouth that was I was like nervous for <laughs> nervous was like that too much that shit in my mouth and then like you know that stuff doesn't wash off right so my face and my hand were that weird bluish green color for the better part of a day and a half and like even after two rounds of brushing my teeth and like a meal, like breakfast and dinner and all that kind of, like the next morning, all I could taste still was I die poly like that. You know what? I die poly smells like that, that, that mm. smell, that exact smell was stuck in my mouth for like 
<laughs> for like for like a solid 24 hours. <laughs> Man, I've spilled so many Dixie cups with dye onto a disc and had to try to fix it. That's probably if I have a signature die or di mi mistake, error, fail, what it is. But unfortunately, like I said, it just happened on the last disc that I worked on. So I haven't quite, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't quite learned from it all the way. I considered wearing the sweatshirt that I spilled <laughs> the dye onto for the podcast. It's the same T D sweatshirt, but the white one. Of course, it was the white one, right? Of and like course. the whole. This whole area is just like checkered with this is now a smock <laughs> See, all over the shoulder. <clears throat> you need to get those produced and market those now. Those are the T. Diddy die <laughs> spill shirts. Yeah, the T. Diddy smock. Yes. <laughs> That's what's coming uh, out next. Do you have, uh, I know you've said this a lot, but do you have any specific words of wisdom you'd like to give your fellow dyers? There's nothing more than, like I said earlier, knock over the damn first domino. Let him start to fall. You're going to get somewhere that, like, you could have never imagined. But, like, if we want to take it out of the existential realm and put it into something more tangible, I would say, like, just learn to patiently fall in love with every step of the process. Like, they are all, every one of them, it's just as important as the one that came before or after it, even if it doesn't like include transferring fancy colors and designs all over the disc. And I get it. Like I said, I used to loathe those crazy stencils, but now like they're my Zen and, and, and it is, it's all because of that, that trance that will send me in to the moment and let the rest of it just shed away. Like that, like I said, that's what happens. Like I was keeping myself from some of that in the beginning by looking ahead at some of the steps and I don't know, ranking them and how awesome they were, or how much I didn't want to, you know, how much I didn't want to <laughs> want to do them. But if you're able to get into that spot, that, that in the moment spot, it makes like the uber patience that some of these next level dies that you think you'll never be able to do. Like it makes them pretty, pretty easy. Like it, it just, the wave carries you there. It, it, if you, if you can just fall into that, that right, that was, that was existential crap too, wasn't it? That, <laughs> that wasn't, that wasn't tangible at all. Oh, but that, that's definitely the best piece of advice I have, you know, just learn to, just learn to love it, you know, and fall into the damn thing. So, I could ask more die questions, but I feel a lot of the questions that I'm going to ask have been talked about in your videos, and I wanted to talk more about stuff that may not have been in your videos. So, we're going to get to know Bobby more on a personal level here, not that we haven't already, uh, <laughs> but we'll get to some small talk questions to fill some time. Uh, favorite fave, do you have a favorite band or song? I'm definitely into some old school funk. That is, without question, my favorite flavor of music. If I'm picking a favorite band, like people like James Brown and Stevie Wonder and Bill Withers and Curtis Miffy, I mean, like I could go on and on with my list of funk favorites. When I was growing up, like I mostly listened to like, all, like classic rock and alternative and a bunch of 90s rap. And I don't know, it pretty much... It pretty much all makes my Pandora thumbprint playlist when I'm jamming out over the turntable now, but it is definitely the badass funk tunes that will occasionally make me get on up <laughs> on my good foot and shake this camper up a bit. Um, so funk, that's where that's where I live when no one else is listening. That is groovy. Uh, <laughs> what is your favorite food? Favorite food. I'm going with any of my mama's home cooking. I'll take any of it. It's it's all good. Anytime I can get it, too. Since I was a wee little hucker, though, back in the day, her tuna casserole is probably what has held the top spot. Even the leftovers are just as good, you know, as the first time. She'll always cook up like a ginormous batch. 
So then there's like four or five days of it worth when I come over and get some. <laughs> That's my favorite. Mama's tuna casserole. Man, I haven't had a uh, good tuna casserole in a while now. Now I'm hungry mm. for it. Underrated. What is your favorite beverage? Uh, well, I'm not much of a drinker. Like I said earlier, migraines yeah. are one of those things that I wrestle with. And like a, a nasty hangover is surefire migraine so like i do my best to avoid them in that way but when i am tipping them up i really like the brown stuff gentleman jack is probably one of the few boozes that you will pretty much always find on my shelf outside like if we're going with non-alcoholic drinks my number one favorite is ginger ale which just so happens to go great with Jack Daniels. So, you know, either way, I guess we're taken care of there. So besides disc golf and disc dying, what other hobbies do you have? I guess I mentioned a couple of them real quick there earlier. Uh, at the top of the list is, is probably kayaking. That is, you know, that, that, that's where things all just started to unravel again for me in my head um, and, and start to turn around there is just something healing about a sunset in a kayak that I'm not going to try to ruin with words. It like, you just have to float it to get it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's at, it's at the top of the, my list. And you know, all of my buddies are way into kayaking too. We, we pile all of them up into the back of my truck a few times a year and go hit some of the rivers in the area to take a break from the Chesapeake. I guess after kayaking, Next on the list for hobbies, stress relief is probably playing guitar, even though after a few decades, I'm really not all that good. <laughs> all that good. I kind of like plateaued somewhere in the strummer and screamer range. <laughs> but like, I, I, I love pulling out my old axe and howling at the moon, no matter how bad I am at it. There is actually some video evidence of it that somehow made my Facebook page because of my super sneaky baby sister. <laughs> she, she, she posted a video of it up there that, like, I guess if you feel like being tortured through a T. Diddy serenade, you can go dig it up and run, <laughs> run that one to ground. Basketball is another one of my big loves. That was, I was always with a basketball in hand growing up and, and played it a lot going all the way through my life. Uh, sadly, I'm at a phase now where I probably pay a lot more basketball in the video game world with my main man Jojo than I do in the real world. But my bones are getting old. So, <laughs> so and then, you know, in the evenings, video games often win over TV when there's not a good game on, if you want to call that a hobby, I guess. But that pretty much makes up the whole list of crap that I can fit in outside of like T Diddy in real life on a regular basis. With uh you know the disc dying and disc golf, I feel like music is another outlet for people to <sighs> relieve stress and get their creativity and just honestly it doesn't matter how good you are, it's just strumming along, playing, noodling. Um at least for me because I play guitar as well. It's you know awesome. You get lost in it, you just kind of yeah, the trance is there too. Mm -hmm. The trance is totally there too. Yeah, um, and singing as loud as you can. There's something to that, <laughs> even when you're not good. There's something <laughs> to that. Yes, that's letting the that's getting the poison out. Mm -hmm. You know that you didn't know was in there. Yeah, <clears throat> I love playing guitar. That's, that's one of my favorites. Uh, what guitar or guitars do you have? I have. Like right before DVDs became like a hundred percent obsolete, mm -hmm. I, I took my entire DVD collection. I had a huge one too, like a whole separate shelf, eight feet tall, you know, just holding them all. I took them to a pawn shop and I, I traded them in for this amazing 12 string Ibanez guitar. That, that is my, the most recent one uh that i have and then it, all the I, I i'm an acoustic guy they're all mm. acoustics um my pops has an old classical guitar that he's handed down to me that i will play as well there's something about 
the nylon strings. It's just mm-hmm. so, you know, different. I, I, I got three over here, uh, a, a Fender acoustic, the Ibanez, the 12 string, and then the, that classic guitar from my pops that I tear into on the regular. That's awesome. Is that 12 string acoustic or is that electric? Yes. Yes. It's acoustic. I mean, it's acoustic electric. It's got a plug in yeah. that I've, that I've never used once, <laughs> but, uh. but that, I, like it, it was such a daunting task. I know that's not what we're here to talk about, but like stringing a 12 string guitar. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, how, how is it tuning that? <laughs> yeah. The tuning I cheat on. I have a tuner. That's mm-hmm. what I plug in to the, to the, out, you know, to the jack on there. Um, but the tuning I cheat on and, and, and use a tuner for. But man, it sounds, it sounds magical. Yes. Yes, it does. When you're playing it. Like the harmonies that come out of that piece of wood are incredible. Even when you suck a guitar, <laughs> you suck a guitar, it just makes you sound so much better when you're strumming. Uh, but that's been, that's been a big part of my stress relief for a long time. And like you said, even more than playing it, like just having music playing in the background and something occupying the back burner to keep mm-hmm. some of those, you know, little things that creep in and get you off or whatever to keep, it helps keep some of those out. Mm-hmm. Um, and music has in a bigger way than just playing it been a big part of my own you know healing process i'll call it you know all through all through life so back to the disc golf if you had to pick three discs to use for the rest of your life on any course what would those three discs be i'm guessing like i imagine that like a driver a a mid-range of putter is the way to go for for the driver i would pick my champion turn which has historically been like the disc that I can throw the furthest and have the most control with. For some reason, I'm not sure, sure what it is. It, also, the champion turn that's in my bag is still one of the original Sharpie drawn from that list that I won't share all the names with you with list. <laughs> <laughs> and then for the MIDI, I'd probably pick my Star Mako, which... It, like forehand or backhand is the disc that I can, when I need to, keep it the straightest. And I have a Star Mako in my bag, died by my main man X to the Z, with a James Brown tribute die on it that's filling that slot right now. And then the putter, like even though the blunt gum putt has been in my bag for 20 plus years, it would still be a tough decision between that and my custom dyed put the D in the B discraft Zeppelin. <laughs> but, you know, I've been carrying that gum putt around for 20 years. It probably would not be the time to separate it. Uh-huh. So, turn Mako gum putt. Final answer. Is that Mako a regular Mako or is that a Mako 3? It's actually a Mako 3. You're right. It's it, it slipped out wrong. It's the Mako 3. One of the few zero zero discs out there. So, dream date. If you had to pick any pro disc golfer to hang out with, play around, and chill, who would that be and why? To be honest, I'd, I'd probably rather like just have a card full of, of, of TDD Army nutbags on it (laughs) like i am i I am in awe of what those bionic humans can do with plastic circles and i've got to see it up close and personal three times now but like i don't know any of those fools and like none of them want to hang out with me i'm sure of that (laughs) so i'd probably say like, g- give me a card of all my buddies or like a bunch of TDD Army nut bags, and I am at my happiest. Um, I, I was into watching them. Like, when I went to those tournaments, I had the VIP pass, mostly because it's hard to park my truck and I need to make sure that I get the VIP spot. <laughs> but, like, one of the things with those VIP passes was that, like, you got to go to all these meet and greets or things where they would sign discs and you could talk to them and, like me and my buddy, like we didn't go to any of them and not, you know, because like, I don't know. What was I going to say to them? Like, Hey dude, sorry. You had to come here and hang out with a bunch of people. You don't get, 
<laughs> you know, you don't give a damn about. <laughs> Can you sign my disc? Um, <laughs> so, I, I hope that doesn't make me sound like a jerk or anything, but... <laughs> no. But, you know, I'm sure that they would... No, 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 hang on me. So... <laughs> I'd probably rather just hang out with a bunch. I, I'm lucky. I bumped into a, a, a few TD Army generals out on the course and like just randomly got to walk off around and get to know some of them. And they're some of the coolest, most fun rounds I've got to have out there. Um, so that's another one I'm going with on final answer. TD Army nutbags. Yeah. That's a great answer. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> Thanks, man. So, Bobby has died a disc for you all that you can win for as little as $1. Uh, 100% of the proceeds go to the starving artist Bobby. So, if you want to help him out, continue to make these awesome videos and uh, produce this great content, I would highly recommend to uh, check that out. So, the disc will be live for raffle when this podcast go live. Then it will be live for two weeks after that. And you can find that raffle uh, somewhere, but you can find on dyersguild.co for that. So um, is there anything that you wanted to say about that disc? I got I got it right here. I mean, it, it got a little sneak peek when I was moving the camera around. It's a design that I did before. Can't tell you, you can see it. And the glare always makes it so tough. But this is one of like the original OG downtown boomtown designs that I worked out myself with the mirror ball long before I had my man at Cobb One Art do all those signature designs for us. And he did like a way cooler downtown boomtown design. <clears throat> this design is a, is a little tough with the stencil and like most all of my discs it is definitely not perfect it's very close to awesome but you know it's got its little bleed spots here and there to give it its character but it is it's ready for one of you huckers <laughs> so if you want ready a you. unique one-of-a-kind handcrafted sweat poured over this uh, you can win that disc so uh what disc is that on it is a vip warship a uh, hundred and seventy gram West Side VIP warship, hundred and seventy grams. I figured a mid range. You know, I have a a ridiculous number of discs here at the place. I figured a mid range was probably one that you know could fit for anybody. Fantastic. All right, yeah. So definitely go check that out. And um, where can people find you? Which I think it's hard not to find you. <laughs> we're not. We're not. We're not that hard to find now you know all you got to do is search for t diddy or the difference is doing it. it our youtube channel at least since the start has pretty much been the hub for everything because i mostly suck at social media <laughs> make content post content is about as complicated as my formula has gotten but it's all started at the youtube channel so you know you just go there and search for us you'll find us and it pretty much anything and everything that's going on i announced there we have a facebook page and an instagram page where i post on the regular with what's going on and pictures of discs and all that stuff and you know you, you can always go we have our website up the difference is doing it.com where you can check out our stuff or buy discs or pins or shirts or all that kind of crap um but <clears throat> we're not hard to find and beyond that like people can just reach right out to me if they want it, it, like hit me with a dm hit me with an email <sighs> I'm lucky enough where like I still get to wake up almost every morning to like a, another batch of, of emails and DMs titled like, check this one out <laughs> with, with another uh, hot set of attachments with uh, some dyed discs. And I'm telling you, like, it's a, it's a really awesome so shot of juice to start the morning off with. So like, if you're thinking, I don't know, I'm a regular dude, hit me up. <laughs> <laughs> just, just hit me up, right? We maybe we'll become friends, and and that's that's always a good way to get a hold of me too. Just just hit me up. So <laughs> definitely go check them on YouTube, Facebooks, Instagrams. You know wherever you can find you, uh, you won't be disappointed. So, all right. Well, uh, Bobby, I greatly appreciate you having uh, been on here. I hope the audience has learned something a little bit more about you. Um, so until next time, we'll talk to you guys later. Keep doing it guys. All right. Keep doing it. Peace.